get started. So hi everyone. I am happy to welcome you to the final day of Career Boot Camp, where you learned how to elevate your career to new heights. Please note that this session will be offered in English and in French simultaneously. To view the French event, please return to the Zoom lobby and join the French session. Afin de visiter la session en français, veuillez retourner au lobby et cliquer sur le lien pour la session française. Before we jump into the discussion, I would like to begin by acknowledging that I'm located on the traditional, unceded, and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe peoples. You might know it as Ottawa. The Algonquin peoples have protected and cared for this land since time immemorial. I am grateful to experience the beauty of this land every day. I encourage you all to acknowledge where you are situated as well. Career Boot Camp is the largest conference in the GC, and the only goal is to support you and your career journey. As we move through today's session, please share your questions in the language of your choice by using the Q&A button. You can vote for questions you like by clicking on the thumbs up icon. Please ensure that your questions are related to today's discussion. If you are looking for answers on different topics, you can find resources on the Finn Wiki page. As with all Federal Youth Network events, this will be recorded. All recordings can be found on our YouTube channel. In addition, we're trying something a little new this year. We're offering Another Way to Learn, a podcast series on the Career Bootcamp sessions. After Bootcamp, the podcast will be made available on Spotify and Apple. We would also like to note that the PowerPoint presentations for each session are included on our wiki page, so please feel free to follow along at your own pace. I will now introduce myself. My name is Trinity, and I will be your moderator for today's session on mastering video recruiting platforms. My pronouns are she, her. I have blue eyes, brownish ginger hair, and I am wearing a black turtleneck with hoop earrings. I am the co-president of the Cernak ASCM Professionals Network. I am also a junior social policy analyst with Crown Indigenous Relations and Northern Affairs, where my work focuses on coordinating governing bodies that oversee the implementation of modern treaties. Our learning objectives by the end of today's session, we hope that you will be able to explain the benefits of video recruiting platforms, overcome some of your apprehensions towards this shift, have knowledge around best practices and feel more confident in showcasing your skills and personality during these interviews. Before we get into the content of the presentation, we have a couple of quick polling questions. This is not a test, it's not mandatory, and it is absolutely anonymous. We're just trying to gauge your perspectives and experiences with video recruiting platforms. I see the poll has been launched. The first question is, have you ever participated in a video interview? Yes, multiple times. Yes, once. No, but I'm familiar with the concept. No, this is entirely new to me. The second question is, how do you feel about being interviewed via video recording platforms? Comfortable and confident, somewhat comfortable, but with reservations. Neutral, no strong feelings, slightly uncomfortable, but willing to adapt very uncomfortable and apprehensive. We'll give you all a few moments to answer the questions. All right, the results are in. So as the results are showing that the majority of people have actually participated in a video interview multiple times and second coming up at yes once. And we're seeing that most people are somewhat comfortable, but with reservations, slightly uncomfortable, but willing to adapt. All right, that's good to know. Thank you for participating in the poll. Now let's move on to the introduction of our panelists that we are so grateful to have with us today. We'll hand it over to Natasha first, and then over to Jen for some introductions. Thank you, Trinity. Just to make sure that you can hear me. Perfect. I'd like to begin uh, by acknowledging that I am in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of, of my people, the Mi'kmaq people. I'm from uh, First Nation, I am First Nation from Gluskap, which is a community in Hansport, Nova Scotia. 
So I'm happy to be with you all today. Um, as I, as Trinity stated, I'm Natasha Agnew and I identify as she, her. I'm a senior HR advisor with the Public Service Commission of Canada in the Indigenous Center of Expertise. It's probably my favorite role to date. And as I mentioned before, I uh, am Mi'kmaq um, First Nations from Gluskap. So I joined the Federal Public Service in 2007, um, and my career has kept me in a field that I'm passionate about, human resources, uh, staffing and recruitment in particular. I've had the privilege of working with a few departments over the, my career um, as an HR advisor throughout those whole, what is it now, 17 years uh, with CBSA, Canada Board of Services, Employment Skills and Development Canada, Health Canada, Public Service Commission, uh, Environment Canada, and now the PSC. So there's always opportunities and amazing opportunities with many departments. My current role, though, is, is focused on uh, increasing Indigenous representation uh, by providing advice and guidance to um, other departments and agencies with the intent of, of reducing and removing barriers to Indigenous recruitment. Uh, like I said, it's a role that I'm very passionate about and I love and I, I plan on staying in this role to, until I retire. So thank you for taking this time uh, to spend um, the day with us the afternoon and to learn more, um, to learn something new, I hope. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jennifer McDougall. Um, I am typically coming from the Mi'kmaq territory, but however, I am in Ottawa today for the Algonquin Anishinaabe territory. Um, I am a learning advisor across the GC. I have worked at learning most of my career, and my passion is welcoming new public servants and giving them the tools they need to be successful in their career. A large part of that has been staffing and understanding the staffing mechanisms, understanding how to apply for roles. And I was really excited about this topic because it's something that is fairly new that not everyone has done yet. Um, a lot of us have been interviewed on camera like we are now, but typically it has been synchronous and there are often opportunities to do it asynchronously as well. So uh, in the month of October, I did my very first asynchronous competition where I was a candidate and I really enjoyed it. So I was really excited to be able to share that lens with you today um, so that Natasha can tell us why we do that. And I'll give you some tips and tricks from my own experience because it's recent. Perfect. Thank you so much, Natasha and Jen. I'm looking forward to getting some insights about pretty recruiting platforms. I've personally never encountered an interview this format before, so I'm really looking forward to learning a bit more about it. We'll get started with the presentation where we'll talk about why we use and how to prepare for a video recorded interview. Natasha, back over to you. Thank you. If there's a slight delay, sometimes just takes me a second here with my uh, computer. So why do we use uh, video recruiting? Um, volume management and time management are certainly a great advantage um, that we must mention. So as we know, during COVID, uh, COVID made remote and online activities more of the norm. And we as Canadians, as the whole world, actually pivoted quite quickly in 2020. And a lot of what we do now is online. It's just the reality of uh, our lives now. And it does have its advantages, in particular time and volume management for interviewing applicants. And I think it's a great advantage. And I reap the rewards of that being able to work in my role uh, for Ottawa, being right here in Halifax. So one advantage is that not all interviewers need to be present at the same time and they don't want to be located in the same location. And that's a huge plus. Hence, time zones are not a consideration, which is incredibly helpful. And because we have access to interviews from across Canada, it allows for better volume management. More people can be interviewed since we have more interviewers. And as a HR advisor, that was always an issue trying to find interviewers um, within our local area. Transparency is also uh, a great bonus. And what I mean by that is the fact that interviewers have the ability to go back and review uh, the interviews if necessary. This is certainly helpful for you as an interviewee, but also um, for the interviewers. So if they've missed something or they wanna double check, they have the ability to go back. That's something that obviously you can't do in a, in a live interview. So common video platforms that are being used today are MS Teams, uh, VidCruder, HireVue, Spark Hire, et cetera. And there may be a number of other platforms that, uh, that we end up using across the government of Canada. 
And here's some interesting stats in a recent annual report from 2021-2022, uh, Building Tomorrow's Public Service Today, which is on Canada.ca. In 2020 and 2021, departments and agencies um, subject to the Public Service Employment Act made 52,232 hires from outside the public service. In 2021 and 2022, the number of external hires rose again to 64,796 hires outside the federal public service, an increase of 24.1% over the previous year. The other option or the other uh, convenience with online uh, video is the interview can also be done at your convenience, which this is a huge plus. This means you have greater control of your surroundings, which can help applicants feel more at ease uh, during the interview. You don't have the added stress of navigating a new space on your way to an in-person interview. You can relax at home or wherever you choose to do the interview and focus on being in a calm place that's best suited for you. And it's just a win-win. Jen? Thank you, Natasha. I'm glad that you set the groundwork because I know a lot of people don't enjoy the thought of doing an asynchronous recording of themselves. They find it a little bit stressful, but I think it's important that we understand why. There's a lot of advantages to the system, to the managers, and to the individual candidates as well. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my experience, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that come up. So I'll just read to you what's there, and I'll add a little bit to that before the interview. So you should dress for that as if you were dressing to go to an interview. My personal tip is I dress head to toe as if I'm going to an actual interview because it makes my posture feel different. It reminds me that I'm supposed to be talking professional. Um, if you're a business on the top and a party on the bottom and you're wearing sweatpants, you're not going to necessarily be as professional as if you're wearing actual work clothes head to toe. That's just a tip. Um, they can't see it, but it does help your posture and the way you speak a little bit. Um, keep your background clean so you have the blur function, but also keep in mind what's in your background, especially if you're in a space where there's other people or if you're in a space where there's clutter. A lot of us are working from home, so just be really conscious about the space that you're choosing and what they're looking at. You never want the person to be looking at what's behind you. You want them to focus on you and what you're saying because so much of what we say is in our nonverbal. You want them to be looking at you while you're speaking. Definitely familiarize yourself with the portal. So I will admit I'm terrible with tech. And that was my biggest concern when I found out I had to do an interview that way. I thought, oh no, like what if, what if, what if I can't open it? What if it crashes? What if my Wi-Fi drops? What if I don't know what to do? What if I, the sound's not working? What if I don't know how to unmute? All of those things were what I was most concerned about. So I will tell you what came in the email. The email was so detailed. Everything was laid out exactly what you needed as far as software, if you could do it on your phone or not. There was test links. There were things to check as far as your like diagnostic testing. There were tips and trips as well. So you were able to test what the, uh, the portal looked like and the platform looked like before you actually had to do your interview. So I felt a lot better about that. Um, it actually also came with a list of do's and don'ts and tips and tricks. So the one that I did was with VidCruder. So VidCruder actually had its own tips and tricks, which were similar to the things that we're talking um, about now. Make sure that the lighting is in the right place. So be conscious of the fact that you, the light should be coming towards your face and not from the back because you don't want to be in a shadow. But those are things that we're already familiar with because since the pandemic, a lot of us have been working from home. Even if you haven't been working from home, you have been talking to other people through different means and you know, like, shadows versus light and what's going to look best. So just set that up well in advance for yourself so you don't have to worry about it. Um, also like the height of your camera, what is it looking at? Those are things to be aware of. Um, again, I said body language. So be conscious of what you're doing with your body. Um, a lot of the tips talk about like knowing what you're touching, what you're looking at, where you're focused. So if you have multiple screens, make sure that you're not doing this and talking to that camera because the interviewer wants to see you. So when it's time for the interview, read all the instructions. I know you're excited and I know you're probably really nervous. And I know that when I'm nervous, I definitely skim. At the best of times I skim, but I know even when I'm more nervous, I don't read thoroughly. So read the instructions. If you need to print it out and underline things, like do that, but read what it's asking. 
read the instructions for the portal. Is it going to start right away? What's going to happen in the first question? It shows you a, te a test question at the beginning so you know what it's going to look like. So make sure that you're prepared and that you read the instructions and know what's going to be expected of you. Also read the instructions in the email about how long it's going to take. So this is so important. It'll say how long it's going to take. I think mine said it was going to take like 120 minutes. So I knew I had to evacuate my house at that time. I turned off now again, text not my strength. I turned off everything that was running on the Wi-Fi in our house so that I would be using all the Wi-Fi. I was as focused on maintaining that connection when I did my bid cruder as at when I was trying to get Taylor Swift tickets. It was just me in the house, no dogs, multiple layers of doors. I had all my focus. I had my notes. I was 100% ready. And you need to be that focused so that you can do your best at answering the questions and then presenting the answers properly. Um, check the timer so look it'll say how long you have until it starts to record and it will say how long you have to do the recording it will say if you have multiple attempts or not mine did not have multiple attempts um if you have multiple attempts though keep in mind you can't go back and typically your first guess is your best so it's probably good for you to think about how you're going to attack that if you have multiple attempts um, obviously do the tech test. I did my tech test the day before and the day of because tech is my biggest concern. Resist the temptation to jump ahead. So really focus on one question at a time. Really be prepared. Uh, I made a list of some things that you can bring to get yourself prepared and to have everything that you need with you. But don't get too excited about what other questions there are because it's timed for each question. And make sure that you're looking in the direction of the camera because your body language and your tone are so important. Your tone will come from if you're reading or if you're just talking. And so another recommendation is to write in bullet form and then fill in the blanks kind of like on this slide rather than reading from a script because that will also give them a little bit of your personality. So I have lots more to add, but I know there's gonna be lots of questions. So I'm sure I can add along there. Let's head to the quote on the next slide, please. Uh, but above all, in order to be, never try to seem. So it's important that you're your authentic self. This applies in all interviews. Uh, it might be a little harder to do actually in a virtual interview because the person isn't face to face and can't read all of your body language. But it's always so important to be authentic and be you in an interview. Because when we're creating a pool, sometimes a pool can be very vast. You want them to remember you. So make sure that you show us the real you. And so um, that is something that I was really conscious of when I did mine. However, I do a lot of things like this. So I was a little bit more at ease. But if you need to practice, practice, make some recordings of yourself, just like you would if you're making TikToks, record yourself, play it back, play it back. You don't have to share it with anyone, but just see how you sound. And is that how you want to sound? Is that authentic to you? Trinity, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you so much, Jen and Natasha. I have to admit, when I first heard the term video recruiting platforms, I thought it was a virtual interview. And I thought to myself, oh, no big deal. But these are in fact very different. So I appreciate all of the very detailed information that you've provided today. And I hope you got those Taylor Swift tickets, Jen. I really hope you did. <laughs> yeah, great. <laughs> So we'll move on to questions from the audience, of which you may use the Q&A function. Please remember that you can vote for the questions you like most by using the thumbs up button. I will only ask the most voted questions. Now, I see lots are coming in to our Q&A, but I will get everyone warmed up with just one to start with. So for the both of you, how can applicants stand out positively in a video interview beyond the standard advice. Um, Natasha, if you'd like to answer first and then I'll, Jen, you can chime in afterwards. I think maybe Natasha might be having difficulty with camera. Jen, did you wanna go first? Just yeah, to... I'll go first while we get Natasha back. Um, so how can you stand out, I think, be you. And in order to be you, you need to remove all the barriers that are making you nervous and seeming inauthentic. So for me, in order to be my real self, I have to know that everything in my sphere that I can control is under control, and then I can relax and be my real self. So make sure that you can control whatever you can control so that you can give your best delivery of yourself. Because for me, 
the way you want to stand out is you want to be unique. You want to do something that will be like, oh, remember when we saw that interview, that person was brilliant. Or remember when they did that, that was so funny. Like they would totally fit in on our team. You want to do something that they're going to remember and not just check all the boxes. But if you're really, really nervous and you're scared of other things happening in your environment that you can't control, you'll be hyper-focused on just kind of answering and doing your star and going through your answers and we won't get a real feel for you. So again, I know that that's something that I say a lot, but I think it's so important that we get a feel for who you are so that we know what we're getting when you join our team. Natasha, what do you think? Yeah, I agree. I think I might have, uh, you might have missed me for a second. <laughs> My computer wasn't working there. Um, yeah, I agree. I think, I think, Jen, you did a really good, and when you were talking today about being your authentic self, I think you gave a great example of what it's like. You can really tell and see your personality and the way that you are appearing today. And I think for, for anybody, and the best advice, and we said it before, is practice, practice, practice. Um, I'm from a generation that didn't grow up with technology. Um, you know, I'm in my 50s and I started back, there wasn't computers. Um, I've been forced to familiarize myself with um, doing these kind of interviews. And I think practice is the best way to see what you look like so that you can be authentic. You can then be comfortable with that uh, being online so that being yourself and being able to add extra during an interview, going beyond um, the basic answer, that you're not nervous about being in an interview so that you can add the extra. And I think practice, there's no other better way than doing it. And I think for, for individuals that are our youth and younger than us, I would say and dare to say that they're more comfortable with these kind of platforms and practice, practice, practice. Absolutely. Thank you so much for answering the question. And what I'm hearing is that the basics of being prepared for a recorded interview are quite similar to what we would usually do for a virtual or in-person interview. It's just getting used to that new platform of applying those skills and those tips and tricks. I think that can provide us with some comfort and make us feel a little bit less nervous about using this type of platform. I'm seeing lots of great questions in the Q&A. So we'll go first with the one that has the most votes. What are some key etiquette considerations for following up after a video interview? We have not met the individuals who are screening. Um, Natasha, do you wanna take a punch of this one? Okay. Sure. Yeah, I think that it's following up is, is always a good idea and doing it in a way that is, um, you have to be careful with the way you're wording it. So I think nowadays, the best way to follow up, obviously, is through email. Um, and there's usually somebody that you can reach out to. And I think the key is knowing who that individual is. Are they an HR assistant? Are they actually the manager? Because sometimes you won't specifically know who you're reaching out and their role, and sometimes you will. So I think the, the, the best thing, advice that I can get it, give is to express gratitude for the opportunity that, uh, that you were assessed and make sure to be polite. Make sure you spell check before you send the email. Um, make sure that you know who you're communicating with. And typically on like, for instance, with a government job poster, there is an automatic email address that we place on a job poster. So that would be your first point of contact. Now, if you feel like that's just a generic um, email, then you can always send an email and say, is there somebody that I can reach out to that would be appropriate that I could thank and to, to do a follow-up with. Um, and remember that following up is a way to stay engaged and, and to demonstrate your continued interest. So it could set you apart uh, when it comes time to the board in making final decisions. However, avoid to be uh, overly um, persistent or pushy. One email may be enough. And also be aware of the time frame that, um, that you might want to allow before you follow up because uh, interviews in, in many organizations can take a little bit of time and the assessment afterwards and, and finishing off the assessment can take some time. I always encourage hiring managers to let the applicants know the window of when they may hear back. And that would be the time period that you wanna go through and make sure in some email, you can probably see it, to determine when is a good time to follow up. Uh, if they said that the interviews were going to be done at the end of February, wait till the end of February to follow up. So Jen, do you have anything to add to that? 
I do. I have a couple of things that I'll add, but then I was thinking about what you were saying. Like, okay, what did I do? So because I just did this, I wanted to think about what would I recommend versus what did I do? So I got an email notification saying that I had made the pool. At that point, I did message the appropriate person who was doing the hiring and let them know. I said, you, you would have seen my interview, but I haven't met you. And I wanted to introduce myself. So I reached out with that saying, I've made the pool. You've probably seen my, um, my recording, but we haven't met. And I wanted to introduce myself. And actually she wrote back and said, I remember your recording. And actually I wrote down what she said so I could share. She said, I was impressed by your thoughtful answers and your sense of humor. So she really did see it because I do tend to, add a little humor to my answers. So that for me meant that I had done a good job of leaving a mark of my authenticity and the way that I had done it. And I did reach out and she did remember. So at that point, I kind of dropped it there. Like I had done all I could do at that point, but I wanted to make sure that I did that. One tip I would also offer, Natasha said that there isn't always a contact person. If you can narrow down what the role is, you can figure out who's doing the hiring typically by using the government electronic directory system, GEDS. So you can do a little org chart search and try to find the right person. And if you know someone in that department, you could probably ask them if that's the right person. That shows a little bit of initiative and a little bit of super sleuthing. That's my expertise. So if you ever need help with that, just reach out. I'll help you do the super sleuthing. But it is nice to send a personalized email. But I, and I also agree with Natasha, like don't hound the person, but you have never met them. So you do have... The right to write to them and just introduce yourself. I just have one thing to to add to that, and it's uh, again, this is before the time of video interviewing. But uh, I had a manager when I became an HR advisor that uh, couldn't hire me because he only had one position in Atlantic Canada, and I kept in touch with him um, briefly. I received my. Um, my results for my language results. And I just followed up with him to let him know that I had received a CBC. So I, my French was pretty good at that point. And because I reached out to him just to let him know, he ended up hiring me as a casual. I ended up getting hired on as a term, which led to me becoming indeterminate. So it was that one contact to let him know that uh, where I was, I was still interested that just happened to evolve into me becoming indeterminate. Thank you both for your answers and not only answering with like factual information, but your experiences as well. I think personalizing the advice you're giving is really helping us consolidate on what we should and shouldn't do when it comes to etiquette of following up. We have a few more questions coming in. I really value being able to question the interviewers as part of a traditional on-call slash in-person interview. Would that component be now typically done as a second interview slash over an email then? Interview interviewers used to be like a date where both parties can assess each other, but with the asynchronous interviews, the assessment can only be done from the employer side. Jen, I think I'll hand this one over to you. Sure, absolutely. So you could, Natasha and I just mentioned that you can reach out to the hiring manager and say you have questions about the role. Um, however, they aren't necessarily offering you the role. So I think that probably the best opportunity would be a little bit further in the process, but I guess it depends. Obviously it always depends. So you could reach out to them and say, I had a couple questions about the role. If you have really specific questions about the organization and the role itself, that shows that you're interested in taking initiative. Um, but if your question is about like, do they provide uh, funding for your MPA or something like maybe don't ask that before you've made the pool because you don't want to scare them off. So it just depends on the type of question you have and where it would fit in the scheme of things. But of course, you're going to meet them before they hire you. So if you make it into a pool, they will always want to meet you for a fit interview or an informal discussion or something like that. I'm sure there's actual good terminology that Natasha can share with us for that, but you'll have an expression of interest and then they'll meet with you to make sure that you're the right fit. They won't just offer you it from the pool blindly. Okay, perfect. Natasha, did you have anything you'd like to add? Yeah, just, uh, that's exactly what I was going to say. I think the opportunity and I, and, and as a manager, um, it, we're used to that now. Um, we know that people want to interview us as well and make sure that we are a good fit for them. 
So there's definitely an opportunity to do that once a position is being offered to you before you accept it to, to want to meet the team and to want to know what kind of management style. Um, I've been offered a few positions where I had the opportunity, was given the opportunity to meet my colleagues that I would be working with so that I could talk to them about the work environment, the manager that would be managing me or my team lead. So it's definitely an opportunity to keep that uh, in mind for when you are uh, further along the process, as Jen said. Perfect. Thank you. So I think the highlight there is although the opportunity to ask questions is not live in that moment with the interviewer, there will be opportunities down the road when it comes to the hiring process and, and other assessments. Our next question is how can applicants effectively prepare to handle technical issues or glitches that may arise during a video interview? And do these issues impact their chances of being selected for the position? I'm not sure if anyone wants dibs on this one. Go for it, Jen. <laughs> I'll start because I was terrified. I'm terrified of technology. Like even today, I'm terrified of even touching my laptop because I'm in a space that I'm not familiar with and anything could happen. So I read that email very thoroughly and there were a lot of links to test things. There was also an indication of what you can do if there is a tech issue. So in my case, they use VidCruder. It said right on it, if you have any technical issues, call this number. There's someone there 24 seven. So if there's a tech issue, the government's not going to hold that against you. The hiring manager's not going to hold that against you. Although you do have to be proactive. You can't only have to do the interview and then say the next week that you didn't finish it because you had a tech issue. You have to solve it in that moment. But there are safeguards in place because nothing is going to work 100% of the time. So just make sure that you know what those safeguards are before you start so that if that does happen to you, you know where the phone number is or you know what the link is or you know what you have to do in order to save your partial work or whatever the the situation is. It will say what to do. So don't panic, just know what it says. Okay. I don't have, I, sorry, I was going to say, I don't have much more to add to that, except for it. I mean, it happened to me today. I, my, my computer started scrolling and it was not allowing me to touch anything. So I had to leave. Um, but it's just about not panicking because it happens to all of us. You know, we prepare and we think we know everything and that something technology, and then all of a sudden your internet <laughs> shuts down out of nowhere. So it's okay. And uh, I think like Jen said, we are really well aware of the fact that anything can happen. So when, when uh, instructions are sent out, everything that can possibly happen and helping prepare the candidates is what, uh, what you will receive. So just making sure you're prepared and, and read and have the number that you need to contact right there if something was to happen or the, the email that you're supposed to contact. Um, there's always someone there to help. So just don't panic. Perfect. Thank you. And, you know, I think the more we start to utilize tech or rely on tech, the more we realize that it can be unstable, which I think brings folks to being a bit more forgiving when we do run into tech issues. Our next question is, I would love some advice on best tips for attending virtual career fairs. It can be really challenging, especially with limited chat times and recruiters often chatting with multiple people at once. How do I make the most of my five to six minutes while also not coming off as unprofessional, asking too many questions rapidly? It might not be directly related to recording platforms, but I think it's a great question. Well, I think that we see that a lot. Uh, I know that the Federal Youth Network offers speed mentoring regularly, and I think that that's a similar situation where there are multiple candidates or multiple learners that want to talk to one expert or one person who's the hiring manager, whatever the case may be. And my advice after having attended a ton of those is to ask a well thought out question. That's how you'll stand out. So don't ask what everyone else is asking and don't ask something that you could probably have looked up online. When someone asks me something that they could have looked up online that I'm like, okay, no. <laughs> so use your time really wisely and make an impact by asking a really well thought out question. That would be my advice. Natasha? Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, um, you know, career fairs is something that at the Public Service Commission we do all the time. And, and there are going to be departments, let's just say there's a, a bunch of various departments or agencies that are there that you really are interested in speaking with. And they might be the busy tables and they might be, um, might be hard to get in and chat, but uh, just be prepared with 
you know, whether it's paper and pen, good old fashioned paper and pen, if there's not an opportunity to speak to someone, there'll always be an opportunity to get someone's email address and which is a great thing to do in that moment, because uh, I would recommend it even if you do have a chat with somebody and have the opportunity, but to really have that one-on-one focus with somebody that maybe is a surrounded by many people and you don't have that privacy, um, try to have a chat, but get the information from the individual so that you can reach out to them through uh, MS Teams and set up a, a virtual call, uh, especially if you're very interested in a specific department or agency and that's who you want to work with. Um, that would be my recommendation. So you can have that one-on-one -on -one time. Perfect, thank you. I also know that the Federal Youth Network has a lot of resources on their wiki page that can provide more guidance on the question that we just answered. On to the next one. Can you talk about the loss of personal connection and the ability to build rapport between interviewer and interviewees during these recorded video interviews, how this impacts the hiring process and how it might impact retention? Natasha, I might turn this one over to you first. Sure. I think some of the things that we uh, we chatted about already are probably uh, applicable in this for this question as well. It's it's about being prepared and, and showing your authentic self. And I think that when you don't have that interaction, um, being authentic and just showing your personality is key. Um, Trini, can you answer? I just want to make sure I, I cover because there was something in that question that I wanted to make sure I made the point. Tell me the question one more time. I'm just trying to pull it up. I think it was to get you this question. No, that's all good. Um, can you talk about the loss of personal connection and the ability to build rapport between interviewer and interviewees during okay. the recorded video interviews? How might this impact the hiring process and retention? Okay, that was part of it that I wanted to say was the the last part of that. Um, and I think, again, being authentic and then using that opportunity again at the end to reach out if you're an individual that's being considered for, for the position, then you have that opportunity to create uh, the rapport or to get to know the person. So it just might not be the same as when you were doing a one on one interview in person with somebody, but that opportunity to show yourself to get to know the interviewer to uh, create that connection can be done. It just looks a little bit different um, because of the way that uh, online interviews are done. But as far as it affecting the ability to get a job, um, you know, assessment boards and, and managers are trained on interviewing and assessing people and, and not being biased. So there's certain things that we do as, as hiring managers, as HR advisors, that we make sure that we don't have a certain bias and that we treat people equally when we're assessing them. Um, and that's by being prepared as a manager and knowing what kind of responses we're looking for. So there's certain things that you, you shouldn't have to worry about, um, but just being yourself and preparing is just, it, it, that's going to be a running theme here that we say today um, and just being confident. Jen, do you have anything to add to that? Yes, I do. So because I've done different types of interviews as a candidate and as a manager on the other side of the board, what I can tell you is from my personal experience, I struggle when there is a live person on the other side, because I'm looking at Natasha and you see how she just nodded. So I'm going to keep talking. But if she didn't nod, I'd be like, oh, that was a mistake. I got to back up. I'm going to backtrack. So because there was no person to try to connect with when I was doing it asynchronously, I was just talking to myself and I didn't rely on someone else's nonverbal cues to tell me if I was doing the right thing. So within a two week period, I had done two different interviews, one with a live audience and one that was recorded. And I bombed the one with real people. And, and that's embarrassing to say, because I actually teach how to do this and I did a really good, bad job. And it's because there was two people on the board that I really connected with. And there was this one, I just couldn't seem to like connect with. And I'm like, she doesn't like me. I'm not doing something right. What am I not? So for me, it's not about building rapport necessarily in your interview. Like in the interview, they really are checking the boxes to make sure that you meet all the competencies. They want to get to know you and they will, once you make the pool, want to know you a little bit better. But for me, I find it's challenging because I'm trying to build rapport with them and watching their nonverbal, which is actually distracting me from doing the task at hand, which is answering the questions and showing that I meet the competencies. So it depends on how you're looking at it. You can create that rapport afterwards. So don't think about it as a loss of opportunity. Think about it as an opportunity to really maintain that focus and control how you answer the questions. 
I think that's a, a really good point that you mentioned about, and that would have thrown me off uh, back in my my earlier years. Is everybody reacts different, especially in an interview, or I think we all know that when when we interact with people, whether it's a professor or um, you know someone new that we meet, everyone has a, a different personality. And there's people that I've met in my career that. I didn't hit it off with right away. And I thought that they felt a certain way. And then we become the best of friends. And that's one thing that I do is in an interview, when there are people face to face with me, I realize that I'm not going to read into their lack of some people just want to put that game face on some people are the scribes, and they're just not looking at you because they were taking notes. So um, that's just a little extra point that because I'm sure some of you might experience face to face interviews again, we're not just all going 100% uh, online, but um, so just keep that in mind that not to let that throw you off and, and practice um, not letting that throw you off when you have the opportunity to prepare. Awesome. Thank you both. I love that we have a theme going of being yourself and being prepared. <laughs> Our next question. I am better in person than virtually. Can I request an in-person interview? And uh, Natasha, I might throw this one over to you too. Sure. Yeah, I'm going to, I'll use the prepared part after the fact, but um, there's always the opportunity. I mean, chances are, and I, I won't say it's a hundred percent the case, but chances are they, it, they won't allow that to happen, but you can always make a request. It doesn't hurt, especially if um, it's your local and, but be prepared uh, with the fact that online and um, video interviews are going to be the norm sometimes. And for consistency, for the board to be able to do the assessing, and this is probably the reason you would be um, maybe denied that request, is because they have a certain format of who is going to be, you know, whether it's a time period or who's going to be looking at your video recruiting or your video interview. Um, it just might be uh, a requirement. So you can certainly ask, but just be prepared for a no. And again, the way to be more comfortable um, with doing them is just pr uh, practicing and being your authentic self is if there was someone sitting across from you. And that is, um, you know, once or two times on the phone and pretending that whether it's even sitting in front of a friend that's in behind your computer, um, then you're just going to be your authentic self. And it just takes practice. Perfect. Thank you. So our next question, I think I'll hand it over to you, Jen. I'll read it first, but just so you know, I'm handing this one to you. Um, In-person interviews allow candidates to take notes prior and refer to them during the interview. Are we allowed to do the same for video interviews? And if so, how do we strike a balance between looking at the camera and looking at our notes, since it may not be obvious to the hiring board that we may be referring to them? Go for it. Okay, that's actually, a, that's a lot of good questions all rolled up into one. So for me, part of being prepared is having for example, what it is you told them you do to meet those competencies. So when you wrote that down, you should probably also have that so you can back yourself up with a similar story. So um, it's important that you have with you whatever you're allowed to have with you. It will say on it what you can and can't do. And I'm sure Natasha can elaborate a little bit on that. But if you are at home and you have your notes, you can make your notes and you can, I made my notes on paper because I am old school and I don't trust technology. So I always have notes on paper, but you could have your notes on a screen. Um, I would caution you though, to not write down everything you're going to say, because you will focus too much on reading. I had made notes for today and I haven't used them because I know that I don't, I just keep it there as my safety net. So you can have your safety net there, ha write down your star, like the S T A R and what you're going to say for each one, just a quick bullet. And then trust yourself to do the storytelling. And that's why Natasha is saying to you like to practice, because if you practice with a friend, you'll be better at telling your story. If you read me the story, it's not going to be as engaging. I'm not going to get a feel for you. And you may kind of, I don't know, pivot to a different place, the way you're telling it than you would, if it was more authentic and you were just doing it ad lib based on your bullet points. So I'm not sure if I actually answered that for you because Natasha can answer what you're allowed to have with you. And what I'm going to tell you is you should have the statement of merit criteria. You should have what you actually submitted in your application. If I was you, I would also open the competency dictionary to those competencies so that you know how to explain that you have them. T 
typically the invitation to the interview says which competencies they're going to be assessing. So make sure you understand thoroughly what those are, how we demonstrate that and have an example just in case that's what they ask you for. Um, and then other things that I would kind of keep close by would be keywords that you know you want to mention. So for example, if you want to say digital, or if you want to say innovation or collaboration, like make a couple of those notes to yourself as well to drop in. But part of being yourself is to speak the way you regularly speak. So reading something is going to take that away. You will lose the opportunity to engage with them that way. So Natasha, what are the rules about what you're allowed to look at and not look at? I don't actually know. Yeah, and I, well, I think when, you, when you're doing, so we will always give you the rules behind it when we're um, inviting someone to an interview. So you, you really will know. And we, so whatever you have in front of you is going to be about yourself. There's really no way you can cheat during an interview because you just, I mean, you, you just really can't. So, because it's about you and your situations or um, the way you've behaved in previous um, work environments. So it, there's, there's not a lot of rules, but there are rules when it comes to, um, you know, being like what we talked about being your authentic self, when it comes to writing down, like, for instance, we talk about the star method, and I'm assuming everybody knows what that means, you know, having your situation, your task, um, your answer, and uh, what's the R for again? Results. Results. <laughs> That speaks to my age sometimes, but I can't remember things. Um, but having notes there so that if you've practiced before and you know, you don't know ex exactly necessarily um, every situation, but if you exact, if you know, for instance, let's say a competency of interpersonal skills. And I think of a bunch of different examples in um, where I have demonstrated really good interpersonal skills and having those stories that I've practiced in front of somebody to be able to have notes written down. Um, in front of you when you're doing an interview, that's going to be fine. There's not, your rules are going to be told to you. So you don't really have to stress too much about doing something that you shouldn't be doing. And I always believe in being um, authentic when it comes to saying what I'm doing. So if I'm going to be reading something and when I'm doing, for instance, learning events online, I will tell my audience that I might look to the right for a moment because I have um, something in front of me that I'm referring to or that I have my notes in front of me that I'm going to be writing. So just if that makes you feel more comfortable so that the interviewer afterwards doesn't realize, you know, where were they looking? What were they doing? Just explain to them what you're planning on doing during the interview that you're going to make reference to your notes and that's why you're looking below. So that's a little extra advice I can add for that. Perfect. Thank you so much. I think our next question sort of builds off of the one that we just covered. Uh, it's in regards to getting questions ahead of the meeting. Um, so with traditional interviews, usually you would get maybe questions an hour to 30 minutes before your interview, you'd have time to prepare. They're asking here with asynchronous interviews, um, they're doing one questions at a time. Are there any plans to display all the interview questions ahead of time before going the loop of recording one answer at a time? So I think it's just wondering like how questions are distributed before an interview. I don't know, Jen or Natasha, how many of you want to go first? I can tell you the one that I did and what it looked like, because that's all I know is the experience that I had. So it would show the question. The question would show up and I think it would give you like 10 minutes to write your answer. So there's the question on the screen and a timer that says 10 minutes and all of a sudden it's like nine minutes and 59 seconds. So it's counting. And then you scramble and like, look at your notes, write your star, write your story, look at the competency dictionary, make your notes. And then, then it will tell you to start recording. So in my case, it gave you the question and a little buffer period to prep your answer, but it didn't give you all the questions ahead of time. So um, in a in-person interview, typically they do that, but that would make sense for a time perspective because they don't want to sit and watch you look up your answers or write your notes. So um, yeah, in this case, it was one at a time and you just kind of ad-libbed whatever the answer was for that particular question. But that was my experience with the one that I recently did. Natasha, do you know if there's a different way to do it? Well, there can be, but my, my, how much time did they give you before the question or before you had to start recording? What was the amount of time? It wasn't very long, like 10 or 15 minutes maybe for each question. Okay. And then you had like maybe 10 minutes to do your recording. I wish I had taken better notes at the time. I was very in the moment at the time. I yeah. wasn't thinking and, about sharing. <laughs> so I should have taken notes. Well, that's certainly a good point because in a in an interview um, in front 
of an actual uh, interviewer is you're, you're not going to be given that amount of time or you certainly could use it, but it's more of an awkward situation sitting down in front of someone for 10 minutes in the interviews. And I, most of the interviews that I've done have been in person and um, you do definitely feel more like you have to answer in the moment and taking more than a minute to write down your responses is I think most people usually end up taking not much more than that. Um, but I would think that it differs. And sometimes you might be, and it's not, it's not just a blanket statement to be able to say that you're never going to have the questions ahead of time. You might have the questions ahead of time that an assessment board um, would provide you because sometimes what ends up happening is you will have a question um, that requires a lot of input a lot of maybe research and that you have to answer in front of the um, online in the video but you were provided with the questions ahead of time because there's going to be a lot of depth to them and a lot of work to them so I, I don't think it's a standard that you're not necessarily going to see but I think Jen's example of how much time she was given with the fact that you are the person that know yourself what kind of work you've done and what were best relates to a question the fact that she was given 10 to 15 minutes is uh, it's quite a bit of time to prepare and you should be adequately prepared to use that time efficiently it all comes back to being yourself and being prepared for anything mm -hmm. <laughs> so i'll ask the last question for a q a as time is just flying by this one is related to your background. I know for myself, I live in an apartment and I'm staring at my kitchen right in front of me. So I'm sort of pushed up against the only blank wall in my apartment for these types of events. But they're wondering if you could provide some practical tips for setting up a suitable background and environment for a video interview, especially if I don't, I just lost the question, especially if I don't have a dedicated home office space. Jen, you can go with this one if you want. Well, in this particular case, you need to find yourself a dedicated space. So um, because you don't want to leave your um, your opportunity to make the pool to chance that one of your wild coworkers runs by or that someone pops into your cubicle or your children are there or your dog is barking, like whatever else can happen. You need to control that space. So visually, you need to control what they see, but you also need to control what you see and other things that could be a distraction. So honestly, like if you have to sit on your bathroom floor with a blank wall behind you, do that lock the door. And because you need a space that is yours that you can control because you need to control as much as you can so that you can feel confident and you don't want to let anyone else have an impact on that. So you could go into your office before work when no one's there, or you could book a boardroom and make sure that there's a sign that says, do not enter. You can kick out your family if they're there. You, because the ones you get, usually you have a wide window. You can do it like on a weekend when your family is out at swim lessons, you can have the house then. So be just really strategic about what you're seeing, but also what you're seeing. Because if there's distractions happening out there and you're like, like that's going to impact you. So make sure that you can find a space and lock it down for yourself. Keeping in mind that you want it clear in the back, but you should also have it clear in the front. That's my opinion. What do you think, Natasha? Yeah, no good advice. It's funny that you mentioned that we have the same thought. I thought about the bathroom floor too. If you have to sit in the bathroom, sit in the washroom, but um, it might be helpful too. And this is just one extra point is if using earphones, um, ones that maybe if you don't feel comfortable using the ones over your head, but if there are, going to be people in your home but maybe they're upstairs or in a different part or the dogs are, are barking uh, two stories up and that's the place that you have to be in your home use earphones at least it'll block out um, the noise that you could potentially hear um, but there yeah I mean there's lots of places libraries there's lots of, I mean sitting in my son's uh, bedroom right now because it has the best um, background and my dogs are out there so when they don't think I'm home they don't make any noise so I found the spot and blurring is really great too, because sometimes I do notice, and this is one point too, um, sometimes we use backgrounds that are provided to us and they can be very busy and going with a blurred background of uh, the least amount that, that the interviewer can see in the back is, is probably my recommendation as well. Perfect. Thanks to both of you. I also, just to chime in a little bit, I've seen some folks use like the little dividers that you can get on Amazon. They're super inexpensive and it can kind of block out, let's say your office is in your bedroom and you don't want people seeing your bed. You can just put a divider behind you and that, that mm -hmm. tends to solve something quite quickly. 
You are both a wealth of knowledge. Thank you so much for just teaching everything that you know today. It's so appreciated. We'll need to close off the Q&A. We'll quickly go over our learning objectives and then on to our closing remarks. If you recall, the learning objectives for this session were to become more knowledgeable about these platforms, gain a sense of confidence using them, and overcome apprehensions with this shift. I hope you all feel that you're leaving this meeting with a sense of security and increased knowledge. We have one final polling question for you. Again, it's not a test, not mandatory, it's totally anonymous. We're just trying to assess how you felt about today's session. So I'll give some time for it to launch. Was this session a good use of your time? Yes, no, I don't know. We'll give you a few seconds to answer. Excellent, thank you so much for your responses. A few reminders and some housekeeping. The FIN will be hosting in-person learning days across the country. Be sure to register super early to guarantee your spot as these sessions will likely sell out. Information including how to register and which cities will be hosting events can be found on the Finn Learning Hub. We will be discussing embracing the freedom to choose between specialization and generalization at 2.30 p.m. Eastern time. There is also an opportunity to drop into kiosks and speak with members of GC communities from 3.30 to 4.30 p.m. ET. You can navigate the expo floor by going to expo tab in the lobby menu. You can move your avatar to enter booths. Inside each booth, you will see a description of the GC community. You'll see meeting space, enter that, and then you can ask any questions you have to representatives in that room. Links to all questions, as well as the networking event can be found on the Zoom events main page. As mentioned earlier, Resources will be available on the wiki page and the recording of this event will be available on our YouTube channel. You can also keep an eye out for the podcast version when it's released. Everyone, please join me in thanking Natasha and Jen for taking the time out of their super busy schedules to share their insights on video recruiting platforms. It was immensely helpful. I will definitely apply all of the advice that we've received today. Thank you so, so much. Hopefully I'll see some of you at other fun events. And if not, I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their day. Thanks again for tuning in everyone. Thanks Trandy, great job. Thank you. Thanks Jen.